So here's a, a graph I'm sure all of you have seen at a, one time or another. Uh, our transistor dimensions scale to improve performance, uh, reduce power, and reduce the cost. And now for the first time, uh, I'll disclose some of our specific targets and our specific plans for our coming 10 nanometer technology. So let's start with the transistor gate pitch. So at least uh, for Intel, for the last several generations, we've been scaling uh, gate pitch by about 0.76x per generation. And that trend uh, will continue going forward to our 10 nanometer technology, where we will offer a 54 nanometer uh, gate pitch. Uh, that is the tightest gate pitch that uh, any company will have in, in production for uh, several years. Now, why do we scale gate pitch? Well, obviously, that's important for density, both logic density and uh, memory or SRAM density. So that's one important factor. Uh, but the other important factor is that the smaller gate pitches still deliver improved performance and lower active power. So how are other companies uh, comparing uh, to Intel? Uh, well, looking uh, at, the, at the past, uh, the 48 nanometer, 20 nanometer, and 20 nanometer generations, other companies were about on par, about matched uh, our gate pitch, but it took them about two years longer to get those into production than, than Intel. So uh, we, we led in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, gate pitch scaling, at least time-wise. But going forward, uh, that comparison of that trend is changing for them, not changing for Intel. If you look at the, the, what other companies call their 14 and 16 uh, nanometer technologies, they use the looser gate pitch than Intel. And uh, what they've been advertising about their coming 10 nanometer technology is they will also have a looser gate pitch. So I think going forward, this gives Intel a density advantage, at least in terms of the transistor gate pitch. <coughs> But this isn't the only metric, it's an important metric, not the only metric uh, that uh, compares the uh, density of one technology versus another. A more comprehensive uh, density metric would be the product of a transistor gate pitch uh, times uh, logic cell height in uh, units of uh, square nanometers, that's the vertical scale. A uh, cartoon of, of what I'm describing is on, on the right hand side there, so uh, the gate pitch will determine the width of logic cells, uh, the logic cell height will determine, of course, the height of the cell, and the product of the two determines the area of uh, the logic cells. And at least for Intel, uh, our trend in reducing uh, uh, logic cell area has been about 0.46x per generation, uh, a little bit faster than uh, uh, you know, typical Moore's law of 0.5x. <coughs> So again, you might ask, well, how does uh, this trend uh, for Intel uh, compare to what the other companies in our industry is doing, are doing? Oh, actually, before I get that, get to that, um, the, the trend is, the metric here is gate pitch times a cell height. Um, but actually, on our last two versions of 14 nanometers and now on 10 nanometers, we're actually scaling our logic cell area a little bit faster than what that uh, simple metric uh, suggests. Uh, there's some other tricks that we're doing on, on 10 nanometers that is providing even faster than normal logic cell area scaling. So uh, although 0.46x was the long-term trend uh, over these uh, over the past four generations, it's actually uh, a bit faster on 14 and, and now again on our 10 nanometer technology. So again, now I ask, uh, well, how, you might ask, how uh, are other companies in our industry comparing to what Intel is providing? Well, when you look at uh, their 40 nanometer, 20 nanometer, and 20 nanometer technologies, they actually had denser logic than Intel. Uh, although that is maybe correctly uh, indicated by the node names that they chose, uh, 40 instead of 45, 20 instead of 32, and then 20 instead of 22. So, Indeed, other companies, other uh, corporations had a better logic density than, than Intel, uh, but it took them about two more years, uh, two years later than Intel to get those technologies uh, into manufacturing. So that's the past, uh, but uh, coming to the present and to the future, it's apparent that they have uh, slowed down their pace of reducing uh, logic cell area uh, at the 14 and 16 nanometer generations and 
based on what they've uh, been describing, uh, they're coming at 10 nanometer generation. So uh, I think at both of those generations, uh, uh, although the node name is the same, you know, 14 to 14, 10 to 10, uh, the logic area scaling is actually a, almost a full generation lead uh, for Intel. So one, one key message uh, I want to leave you with, at least from this slide, is that not all 10 nanometer technologies are the same. So what about the cost per transistor? You know, density scaling is very important, but uh, the real tenets, the real basis of Moore's law is to provide ever lower cost per transistor. Uh, so this graph, this first photograph shows uh, area per transistor, uh, normalized to the 130 nanometer generation. And indeed, uh, Intel has uh, pretty consistently improved uh, uh, area scaling in each generation. And as I just showed you on the previous slides, uh, our 14 and our 10 nanometer technologies have actually scaled the logic area faster than normal. So we're below that historic trend line for area scaling. <coughs> Uh, but another important fact is that the cost of uh, manufacturing these technologies has been going up as we have to add more processing steps and more masking steps to uh, enable uh, this type of scaling. Uh, and that, that uh, rate of, of, uh, of uh, wafer cost increase has been uh, slightly faster on 14 and 10 nanometer technologies. <clears throat> but the good news, at least for Intel, is that uh, the product of those first two graphs area per transistor times cost per, per area results in a cost per transistor that has been keeping pace with long historic trends and, and if anything is slightly below that trend, slightly better than normal on our 10 nanometer technology due to the unusually good uh, area scaling that we are providing. So at least for Intel, Moore's Law is alive, uh, cost per transistor continues to come down. And for those of you who were maybe a little worried about uh, what comes after 10, our 7 nanometer technology uh, will again continue to offer uh, improved area scaling. Yes, uh, cost per wafer will, will go up a bit, but cost per transistor will continue to come down on our 7 nanometer technology uh, versus uh, the previous generations. Now, of course, we do scaling. Uh, not only to provide you know, a smaller area and lower cost per transistor, but we also do scaling to enable a better performance and lower active power. And this graph shows that Intel's trend for improving the gate delay, uh, the inverse of, of performance, uh, uh, reducing switching energy, uh, which uh, determines an active power. Um, <coughs> so um, we continue to provide improvements in both uh, gate delay and switching energy and the result of those two is the energy time delay product. Now I'm showing on this graph uh, for both the you know, 14 and, and 10 nanometer generations uh, uh, you know, one specific uh, version of the technology, which lately we tended to decide to optimize more for energy reduction as opposed to uh, a raw speed. But we can tune, we do tune, we do develop different uh, versions of each technology. Some versions tune more for a higher performance, other versions tune for a, a lower uh, switching energy. But in, in both cases, or in all cases, the energy time to delay product is about the same. That is the basic uh, a goodness or the basic benefit of, of scaling transistors to improve that energy time to delay product. But then again, you can uh, tune transistors uh, separately uh, or whether you want the higher performance or the lower switching energy. <laughs> So again, this is the graph I started with, uh, transistor scaling. <coughs> but there's been another uh, change in uh, how Intel uh, is developing our technologies. Uh, uh, we're no longer a one-size-fits-all company. Uh, we're seeing uh, the development of more and more derivative technologies of each generation. In the past, uh, maybe the two versions, a, a microprocessor version and a SOC or a system on chip version, now we're seeing a, uh, an increased number of derivative technologies. So, so this is becoming more common to either enhance performance and or expand the device feature set that we offer. Uh, one example of uh, derivative technologies is on the 14 nanometer uh, node, 
when we first came out with the uh, 14 nanometer process used for drywall, and then uh, about a year and a half later came out with uh, what we call 14 plus, uh, which provides about a 12% uh, process performance increase and supports uh, other leading edge products uh, on 14 nanometer technology through uh, 2017. And likewise, we're doing even more on our coming 10 nanometer uh, technology. First version will come out as 10 nanometers, and uh, then uh, uh, sometime later we'll come out with a 10 plus with an enhanced performance, and sometime after that, uh, 10 plus plus. So those uh, technologies are already in the works, uh, uh, developing all three versions for the initial of the metal and then the uh, later set of products that come out on uh, 10 nanometers. <coughs> if we refer to this as having a uh, three waves of, of uh, products and th with uh, three waves of uh, uh, performance enhancements coming from the, uh, the process itself. In addition to those uh, performance enhancements, we are also developing derivative technologies that provide an expanded feature set. Uh, some of these features are, uh, are more important so on SOC products than on uh, the mainstream microprocessor products. But some of the features that we provide on the uh, uh, derivative versions of 10 nanometers include uh, uh, not only the high performance logic transistors, but also uh, low leakage logic transistors, uh, uh, transistors uh, tuned for analog design purposes, uh, high voltage IO transistors, uh, precision resistors, adapters, uh, IQ adapters. So a variety of extra devices that are uh, useful for enabling some types of products, but not necessarily um, the normal mainstream microprocessor products. Here's an example of an uh, expanded uh, feature set uh, offered on 10. I'm uh, plotting here the uh, leakage current on the vertical scale uh, versus the drive current on the horizontal scale for both our NMOS and PMOS transistors. Uh, obviously, higher drive current is better and the lower leakage is better. But the point of this graph is to show that uh, at the same minimum gate pitch, 54 nanometers, uh, we offer a, a very wide range of performance and leakage, uh, uh, spanning almost three orders of magnitude. So that really allows uh, circuit designers, product designers to uh, tune their circuit blocks for either a higher performance when needed or a, a much lower leakage uh, when that's important. In addition to you know, developing and tuning uh, transistor types for different products, we also offer a a range of uh, interconnect stacks. Uh, you can start with uh, a fewer number of uh, metal layers uh, for low-cost products. Uh, uh, maybe an interconnect stack that uses more of the dense pitch, tight pitch uh, interconnects for higher density. Uh, and other interconnect stacks that use uh, more of the coarse, loose, loose pitch interconnect layers that provide a high performance. So again, a range of interconnect stacks depending upon what type of product uh, you're trying to make. Of course, all of this uh, progress in uh, developing and the scaling of uh, uh, process technologies is the result of uh, what we call our Innovation Enabled Technology Pipeline. Uh, we have a very large uh, uh, and talented research group located up in Oregon. Uh, they explore a wide range of devices, or as I like to say, they, they cast a wide net. Uh, some you know, very speculative uh, novel ideas uh, not all of them work out in the end. Not all of them are accepted by the development team because they either don't quite uh, meet or, or deliver the performance uh, or the cost or, or the, the power advantage anticipated, but some of them do. And some of them are going to be very successful uh, innovations uh, that make that transition from research to development and then eventually to high volume manufacturing. <coughs> Okay, so for a couple of years now, uh, uh, Intel has uh, been enabling uh, the broader industry to access our technologies through the Intel Custom Foundry. Uh, and now we'll bring up on stage uh, Zane Ball, uh, Vice President and Co-General Manager of uh, Intel Custom Foundry Group to explain how they do that. Thank you, Mark. So uh, thank you for coming. I'm uh, delighted to be here today. For, for years, uh, Mark Bohr has been coming to IDF explaining all about Intel's semiconductor technology. And 
Uh, it's, a, it's a real privilege to be here to talk a little bit about how we can make this technology uh, available to the ecosystem and to uh, semiconductor companies around the world that like to take advantage of these innovations. Uh, we have been uh, working in the foundry area at Intel since our 22 nanometer technology. Now, that was the first generation to develop our design platform and began to engage customers and IP partners. And I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, our early customers on 22 nanometer are in production and uh, we know we're satisfied with our progress there. On the second generation of FinFET technology at the 14 nanometer node, we expanded our ecosystem, customers, and partners. Uh, and you know, we have results from those collaborations as well. And so you know, think of our 14 nanometer uh, products as you know, in the lab. Uh, and then uh, with 10 nanometer, we have built a really full featured design platform and ecosystem, which I'll talk about uh, at length in a few minutes. Uh, and these projects you know, are really in design and development today. Uh, one of the things I'd like to call your attention to is that Intel's a little bit different than some of the pure play foundries uh, that, that you're familiar with, and we have capabilities that go beyond wafer manufacturing. We can do design, we can do assembly and test, we have uh, really remarkable sort and test technologies, and, and so we bring this capability to our customers as well. Intel invests more in assembly test technology uh, per year than the leading uh, top two OSATs. Uh, do combine. And so these are important innovations that enable product success for customers and something that, that we focus on as well. Uh, and then a final part of our foundry are the services that we offer. Uh, we've made considerable investments over the years as we've matured as a foundry uh, across these three nodes to, to build the kind of service that customers uh, expect. Uh, to deliver products to market. So I'd like to share with you uh, some examples and talk about the market segments that we're focused on. Um, there's two key markets that we see as the big opportunities in Foundry. The, the, the first is in the network infrastructure area. You've probably heard this quote of two zettabytes of global traffic by 2019. There's a huge build out of network infrastructure in the industry to take on these kind of data sets. And so that's a great opportunity for us. The other are this uh, explosion in mobile devices, and, and mobile is the largest wafer driver in the foundry industry. So these are the areas that we focused on. I was going to take a look at each one in turn. So if we start with the, the network infrastructure segment, this is where Intel Foundry uh, began its work on the 22 nanometer node. Um, there are three things that really drive success for our customers in the network infrastructure segment. The first is technology density, which Mark just talked about. A second is high-speed series. You have to have really high-performance data pipes in order to uh, make successful products. And then finally, packaging plays a very important role as well. Uh, let's start with density. I, I'm not going to belabor this point since Mark just, I think, articulated very, very well uh, the kind of density uh, lead that, that Intel has. And in fact, that is the number one thing our network infrastructure customers are coming to Intel for. And I'd just like to share, some of our customers have allowed us to make some public statements regarding their products. And Acronix was our first uh, foundry customer. You guys may remember that announcement. And they're, and they're in full production with the Speedster 22i HD 1000 uh, FPGA. Uh, so, so we're d delighted to have brought the uh, full circle with Acronix. And also uh, Netronome is a, is a customer of Intel on the 22 nanometer node with an advanced network processor. These kind of network infrastructure chips are very challenging, they're very complex. Uh, the die sizes can be uh, exceed five or 600 millimeters squared. And coupled with the kind of data bandwidth that you have to feed such a beast, it creates quite an engineering challenge. Um, to meet that data pipe need, you need high-speed service IP. And Intel has its own service IP, and I wanted to show you an example of that today. This is our a 14 nanometer prototype of our 56 gigabit uh, uh, CERTUS. This is a PAM4 implementation. You can see the multiple data levels. We also have an NRZ implementation. Uh, we're very happy with the performance, but we're also very happy with the area and power efficiency of this design. Uh, if you'd like more information about our CERTUS, they, the guys are at the booth, number 383, and you can uh, uh, see some of this technology and, and talk to some of our, our experts. Uh, the, the final piece in our network infrastructure offering is our innovative packaging, and specifically 
Uh, it's how we integrate multiple large dye together with very fast, high density data pipes between them. And we have some leading technology in this space that we call EMIB. Uh, the traditional industry approach is what's called uh, silicon interposer. So you'll have a, a silicon dye that effectively is a substrate and you put the other dye on top. That has some significant limitations. You can only make as big a uh, module as that reticle size of the silicon. It's difficult to yield such uh, uh, configurations and they're a bit costly. We've come up with a better solution that we call EMIB or the Embedded Multi-Dye Interconnect Bridge where we actually take a piece of silicon, embed it in the package, and create those connections. This uh, cartoon here kind of exaggerates the size of that embedded piece of silicon, but it serves to, to illustrate what's going on. And we put several of these EMIB silicon pieces in the package so we can scale to, new, to connect numerous dye. And this allows you to do very high speed, high density interconnects, like high bandwidth memory, uh, and that are really important solutions for building complex uh, uh, NCM assemblies. Uh, this is uh, a high yielding technology. You expect the same kind of yield with any uh, traditional package. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite on stage Dan McNamara from Intel's uh, Programmable Solutions Group. You might know them better as Altera. And they're a very important foundry uh, customer for us. And I'm happy to show that we've got an EMIB implementation with Altera that is the first production implementation. So I'd like to welcome you on stage. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Dan. And, uh, and though, even though you're a part of Intel, you've been a very big part of helping us create the Intel Foundry. And I was hoping you could just share a little bit about your experience and talk a little bit about your first product. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dan. So I'm holding a 14 nanometer wafer that is basically the first and only FPGA at 14 nanometer, which basically, just like Mark and Zane have been talking about, really leverages the scaling across power, performance, and density. And this is going to be the uh, first to market in the next quarter when we deliver it. So, very exciting technology here. Uh, but I think the story is really more about how we got here. So, two and a half years ago in 2013, we were looking at you know, where do we go for 14? How do we get there? How do we really get the scaling benefits? And we started talking with uh, ICF as an independent company. We knew the technology was there, but we had been over 30 years with a foundry. So as you would guess, we had very tight relationships. Our, we had third-party flows. We had our you know, the development kits all set up. So it was a concern about productivity. Would we effectively lose productivity and get to market late? I can tell you that the collaborative approach with ICF when we were with Altera was just tremendous from top to bottom, from executive management down to the frontline engineering, on-site meetings, reacted to our flows, right? really supported our flows, really looked at things completely different, really created a win-win. And I can tell you, I wouldn't be standing here with this wafer today and sampling next quarter if it wasn't for ICF. So it's just been a tremendous engagement for, for the last two and a half years. The other two things I'd like to talk about is, so when we got to market, when we actually finally did uh, tape out, we had the fastest cycle time we've ever had in 30 plus years. So over three decades, uh, this was the fastest cycle time. We also got the opportunity to start much more material than we used to. And that basically, we have a 24 seven power on and qualification cycle going on right now with the help of ICF. And then lastly, the end-to-end -end supply chain. So if you think about our model previously, it was independent foundry, substrate, and packaging vendors. So it was manageable, but if you think about it now, now we have a one-stop shop. Basically simplifying and streamlining our operations, ultimately driving better cost to our customers. So the engagement has just been tremendous. And uh, you know, it was so good that we, we actually talked to Brian and said we wanted to join the company in 2015. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for your kind of birthday. Any comments about the EMIB technology? Yeah, the EMIB. So let me show you. The EMIB is really, this is the first device, by the way, leveraging EMIB at, uh, at Intel. So this shows a Stratix 10 die with four transceiver tiles. So that's the picture there. Uh, what this does, you know, Zane talked about the value here, right? You save cost and you get better performance and better manufacturability and the fact that. You know, there's no interposer here, right? 
uh, all other solutions have an interposer board in the middle between the die and the, and the substrate. That's great, but here's the real beauty for us. This sets us up with a platform for the future. So not only can we add transceivers here, we can add analog. We can add DRAM, which we've already announced. We can add customer ASICs. So this technology really is an interesting technology for us, and it, you can't get it anywhere else but ICF. So we're very, very excited about this technology and, and the, uh, what we're going to bring from a Stratus 10 standpoint. And we're obviously blazing to 10 nanometer with them as we speak. And the advantage here, again, on EMIB would be this. We can go to 10 on the uh, FPGA guy and then de-risk the design around transceivers and the other heterogeneous components and get to market with a very high density 10 nanometer device. So this really is a fascinating technology and much more than just the technical value that Zane talked about. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. All right. Best of luck as we get forward to production. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. All right. So that other key segment that we're starting to work on, I can get my open hands here, our mobile devices. Uh, the, the network infrastructure as one basis of competition to compete in the mobile device market is another thing entirely. Uh, there are three, you can boil it down, I think, three key items that uh, as a founder, we have to deliver on to service mobile customers. The first is time to market. The mobile market moves fast. You don't move Chinese New Year or Christmas based on your FEP schedule. So you have to be there every time on schedule. Uh, the second thing is technology leadership. Mobile devices, they want high performance to deliver the user experience and they need low power in order to drive battery life. And so as those curves on power performance, energy times delay, as, as Mark talked about, as fast as we can move those forward, we can make better mobile SOCs. And then finally, our customers demand a robust ecosystem of IP providers and EDA providers that all work together to deliver the kind of turnkey solutions that let mobile SOC development happen at this fast pace. And so I'd like to talk through a little bit about how we're doing each of these. And let's start with time to market. Uh, for, for the first time, I'd like to share with you uh, that we have one of the fastest, most nimble mobile SOC providers in the Intel Foundry ecosystem. So Spectrum has allowed me to announce today that they are one of our customers at the 14 nanometer node. Uh, Leo Lee, their uh, CEO and president, a good friend of mine, you know, highlights our time to market with leading technologies as well as Intel Custom Foundry's agility, support, and determination uh, to work with them and make them uh, successful. So on 14 nanometer, we are servicing one of the largest, fastest moving SOC uh, players in the industry. Um, a second example, maybe uh, pointing more towards the point of view of leading technology, is a collaboration also for the first time disclosing today. We're working with LG Electronics, one of the largest mobile phone OEMs in the world on a next generation Intel 10 nanometer mobile phone SOC. What brought LG to Intel was our silicon technology, but also our packaging and our manufacturing leadership. And we look forward to this collaboration and I thank Mr. Sohn, especially uh, my good partner at LG for letting us make this announcement with them today. The ecosystem, we've worked very hard, beginning with the 14 nanometer node especially, to build out an ecosystem that lets us enter the mobile market. Now, one thing that's nice about being a new foundry entrant which is that I have the full breadth of Intel's IP offerings right from the get-go. So we started this with a pretty good head start, whether it's USB IP or PCI Express IP or a whole bunch of other things. There's a great portfolio of solutions that already exist within Intel that we can leverage from. But certainly we didn't stop there and we opened our doors to the entire ecosystem. We have uh, the industry's leading players working with us, whether that's Cadence or Synopsys or Ansys or Mentor Graphics or many design services firms that you see there. Uh, Imagination, Northwest Logic, it's a, it's a long list and these partners are really key to our success and we deeply appreciate the investments that they have made in joining us with Intel Foundry to service our joint customers. Now going forward on the 10 nanometer note, I wanted to call out a few particular ones. Uh, in, recent, um, in recent weeks, we've had announcements from our partners uh, announcing their support for the 10 nanometer node with Intel. So ANSYS, Cadence, Mentor Graphics, and Synopsys. 
these partners are the lifeblood of the foundry and they help us bring new customers in and get them to market once they're with us. However, if you're serious about the mobile market, there's one major IP provider that's been missing from the list. And I'm very excited to share with you today that we have brought to the Intel family ARM Corporation's Artisan IP. And I have Will Abbey, the general manager of Artisan IP from ARM, to join us on stage here to talk a little bit about our collaboration on Tim Nanny. Welcome, Will. Thank you, sir. It's a real pleasure to be here today. I'm uh, so pleased that I've got the opportunity to share the stage with you. Um, our journey has been, has been a long journey, but I'm really, really pleased to be here. And I have the pleasure of announcing um, what we are about to do or what we are doing with, uh, with, with Intel and Intel Custom Foundry. Um, it is my pleasure today to announce the agreement between ARM and Intel that will accelerate the design and implementation of ARM-based SOCs on Intel's 10 nanometer process technology. You know, I have to relax a little bit and just recognize the fact that uh, this is an awesome statement. It, it brings amazing technology from ARM. Uh, our 64-bit ARM cores are world-class and well-recognized artisan, artisan physical IP. And it brings that Intel's 10 nanometer technology that can build world-class products that will make a difference from a mobile and consumer perspective. For me, it, it just simply makes sense. You've got the best from ARM in terms of our deep understanding of the ARM architecture, uh, Intel's proven manufacturing capability from an IC perspective. Bringing that together makes sense for a silicon partner wanting to develop high performance, low power mobile and consumer applications. It makes sense for developers. It makes sense for end users like you and I who want design choices. And, and the announcement that we're making today, I think makes a significant difference in empowering the whole ecosystem to make a difference with respect to mobile and consumer. And I do want to pause a little while to recognize that developing leading edge SOCs is challenging. You know, many of us have been at the challenging end of, of, of delays and, and, and design challenges. And what you look for in terms of developing a platform, you look for proven IP. And ARM Artisan IP and the processor optimization expertise, which we call POP, has been used in many high volume consumer applications. If you dig deep in your pocket, you'll find many devices that are actually today based on ARM Artisan POP, ARM Artisan Physical IP. And so this, apart from enabling uh, manufacturing choice, it also puts the pot at the very heart in the hands of the developers. And so the unique thing about pot is that it brings optimization from a processor perspective, optimization from a processor perspective, brings that together and allows developers to achieve PPA that is relevant for the design targets they're hitting for. We're also providing both a high performance implementation and a high efficiency implementation from an ARM core perspective. And so um, we believe that this will make a significant difference. You know, it goes without saying that ARM Artisan IP, you know, we are market leaders, we are technology leaders, and so coming together with, with Intel, coming together with Zane, for me, cements our leadership positions. You know, it allows us to build and bring on another founding partner to mobile and consumer. Um, just to finish off, I do want to stress the fact that we've already started development and um, we'll be in a place where we can support uh, first designs in the first half of um, 2017. Saying so, you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing our collaboration grow and develop and to make a real difference in the industry. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Bill. All right. So. So now I just wanted to re return to my ecosystem chart with that very important piece now, now added to it. So, you know, now that we have all these important players in the industry working with us, making investments and designing with Intel's technology, especially at the 10 nanometer node, we feel we're really well positioned to address the mobile SOC market and really bring this technology uh, to, to, these, to these key customers. Um, it's a, just in summary. So let's not lose track of where we started. What's most important is that we continue to push silicon technology forward. 
The transistor scaling trend, though very difficult from an engineering point of view, we continue to move it forward generation on generation on generation, and we're still getting those benefits. Benefits of cost per transistor, benefits of power and performance. Uh, Mark was able to share the advancements on 10 nanometer and give you a little bit of a flavor of the kind of improvements that we're going to deliver. We believe this will be the industry leading power, performance, and density uh, technology. Uh, and we're very proud as a founder, you have the opportunity to now bring this kind of technology out of the walls of Intel to the broader industry. We're focused on two segments. The first is network infrastructure, FPGAs, network processors, and these kind of technologies that can really benefit from Intel's technology density, our high-speed service, and advanced packaging technology like EMIP. Uh, and now we're expanding into mobile SLCs as well. We have a great set of ecosystem partners that we're very proud of, uh, their investments, and we're very happy to welcome ARM to that uh, ecosystem list today. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, we have uh, all of this available for you. Uh, you can get the PowerPoint uh, off of intel.com. Uh, again, the CERTI's uh, presentation in booth number 383 and at our website, intel.com slash foundry for more information.